worker broker architecture. And then maybe a UI update would be another thing. So first, uh, starting with the worker broker architecture. Um, hey, Andy. Hello, guys. I see a new face there. Yeah, uh, that is Derek Howard. He is the cr creator of Augur. Um, awesome. Came out of his head. Nice and to meet you, Derek. Affected the rest of us. <laughs> nice to meet you, Andy. Yeah. And um, one of the things I, I, I suggested that we would be focusing on today is just, uh, and I just, did I put the notes? I put the notes in chat, right? Okay. Yep. So uh, is just the worker broker architecture and looking at that. And so I think I will make this smaller and share my screen. And then, because one thing we want, like we talked about the UI a lot last time, and we have a lot of work happening there. The latest version of the dev branch is significantly adapted a lot of the feedback from the last Augur meeting. So we've um, moved the repo groups to the front page and uh, made some of the evolution metrics more visible. And currently we're focused on making sure that the comparisons work again and, and that the um, data collection architecture is a little bit uh, hardened, um, which is a, a smaller point but, uh, and more of a back end thing. But we wanted, so I guess before I go on with what I'm sharing, I guess I'll ask if there's any questions from last week or things that people would like to see outside of what's what's on the agenda. Nope, this would be good for me. Okay, so I could try to explain this and I sort of understand it, but it might be better if uh, Gabe or Derek sort of sat in the main chair and tried to explain it. Um, sure. Yeah, all right, can you guys see me okay? Yes. Yep. And can you see, uh, can you see me move the mouse? Yep. Okay. Um, so before I talk about this diagram, um, I think it's important to understand where we were before this architecture so that um, there's a bit of background on what the motivation was for developing uh, the new Augur architecture. So before, um, pretty much all that existed was A. And not pictured in this diagram in both the old and the new architecture are our various data sources. So before a user would make a request, and typically they're wanting metrics, um, but there's other kinds of requests they can make. Um, so they, they make a request for metrics, and one of the Goonicorn server processes would respond to that request, and it would go from whichever um, plugin or source of truth the user had configured, get that metric, and then give it back to the user. And a lot of our metrics, our evolution metrics, especially were driven for uh, out of GH torrents. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I would say 90% of our metrics depended on GH torrent. And uh, GH torrent is just a relational database that represents just GitHub activity. Um, and only part of it. Yeah. And it's, uh, there were a lot of questions raised about the accuracy and the reliability of GH torrents data. And so um, we started to look at, okay, we should rely more on primary sources, like the Git repos themselves, or go directly to the GitHub API. And when we tried to do that using the old architecture, when one of these server processes would go ask the GitHub API, it might, might have to make like 30 requests to be able to fulfill a metric. And so we sat down and we came up with a new architecture um, that includes a data collection piece. And so now instead of... Um, Essentially we had glued together like four or five different sets of data. Right. Yeah. And, and now this feeds into a single schema which we've talked about before. Right. Yeah. So now instead of having the source of truth be defined at the metrics layer, the source of truth is defined in the data collection layer. So um, whenever a user makes a request now, if it's just a metric request that can be filled with um, data we've already collected, the server could just talk to the database and then immediately respond to the user. If 
you make a metrics request that can't be fulfilled, um, excuse me, <clears throat> the server process will um, ask the broker, um, hey, where's this data? And the broker will add to its job queues um, a new job for each um, type of data we're collecting. So for instance, um, let's say these GitHub workers provide commits and they provide um, you know, usage statistics, whatever GitHub might provide. Um, that piece goes into whatever the metric the user needs. So the broker knows, okay, I need to add a job to the GitHub worker queue. And it also knows it needs to get lines added and removed from facade, so it adds a job to the facade worker queue. And then- and those are just two examples. We have right. Other, like, we've got like a half dozen workers now. Right, and these workers are completely configurable. And then these workers are totally independent processes. So the workers that we're building, um, Augur can launch and maintain the process but we built it in a way because it communicates via TCP that we could have workers distributed across many nodes um, and we wouldn't need to um, have to re-architect anything. So if we ever have really complicated workers that use a lot of CPU resources or that we like are de dealing with rate limiting or let's say we need to get past like, you know, a, geographical constraint of some kind, or if you wanted to run one worker behind a corporate firewall, all those things are possible because we've built it in a way that you can have Augur running separate from its workers. So I want to pause and see if there's any questions, but also just note that functionally, what the architecture that Derek's describing means is that when you add a repository, like you've got 20 repositories that you're trying to keep track of as an open source program office manager or community manager, you want to add one to them. Um, what that means is all you have to do is add the repository and the workers will take care of collecting the data. And so if the first request that comes in, obviously if you, if you just add it, the data is not going to automatically be there, but it will, the next time the worker runs, check, notice that it needs to collect uh, data for a different repository for whatever workers you have configured, which would be usually the Git repository or GitHub at a minimum. Um, so, yeah, are there any questions at this point? No, nope. seems cool. Makes sense to me. Yeah, so what John just described is our housekeeper process. And what that process does is it periodically queries the database and sees if we are missing data or data hasn't been updated in some time and we should look for new data. And it will submit jobs to the broker to be distributed to the workers. Um, before a user has ever requested that data. That way, if um, a set of repos have been added and we expect users to want metrics about those repos, then the housekeeper can have those metrics ready to go in the database um, before the user requests it. So that way these server processes never have to talk to the broker. They can just talk to the database, get the metrics, and then, um, and then give it to the user. So where is the database here? It sounds like the server processes can access it. The broker can access it. Every process here can access um, the database. The so broker and the pro the server processes. So the this I think the server processes. The workers. Are, sorry, go ahead. I'm just trying to do the workers connect to the database, or yes. just hand it off to the broker, and the broker does the. So wait, what I would what I let me tell you what I think happens. Maybe you can. Well, so the broker is actually the only process here that does not uh, connect to the database. Okay. Um, the housekeeper does to keep track of tasks and what data needs to be updated and things like querying repos to provide to the broker um, to send out those tasks for specific repos. And then uh, to answer your question, yes, the workers also connect to the database to allow for things like uh, maybe, depending on the worker, it may need to query specific things, but also insertion and new tuples. You know, the workers are basically creating the data in, yeah. in box D. And the API is essentially returning the data to the front end in box A. And box boxes B and C are 
who are responsible for gathering the data and checking that everything's working. Is that? Yeah. Yeah. So each of these workers has to know what the auger schema is. Yeah. And um, and be able to transform its data source into the auger schema. Okay. But the huge that that gives us a huge advantage because that means rather than having to write metrics to specific data sources, we can just always know that our metrics will target this one schema. So we can spend a lot more time working on a metric, knowing that even if one of our data sources disappears, as long as we can get that data from somewhere else, our metric will still function. And what it also lets us do, um, if we were ever to become so large scale that we do what GH Torrent does and collect like a very large sample, potentially all of GitHub, you know, or something like that. I need a heck of an API key for that. <laughs> <laughs> right, Slow down there, right. Well, a big server. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, we don't have the resources to do that right now. But um, the advantage of this is then we can just distribute already collected data to people. They can look at metrics. They could do deeper analysis if they wanted. And they don't have to have their own instances of all of these workers. If they were like really more interested in doing a deep dive of existing data than seeing what the current like latest, greatest data is. Mm -hmm. Okay. So is the the rationale for having each one of the workers connect to the database that they have to all provide a translation to the schema? Because I mean that seems to be the unique component in all of them. Because if you were to, if the claim was that they all just needed to have an awareness of the database, you would think you would not. You could just put that in the broker. You could put it in some sort of centralized shared place. Right. to the database, but it sounds like it's that translation part that so, needs right. to be distributed. And I think there's there's actually, if I think about it, there's two concrete layers inside of each worker. One is the layer that understands where the data needs to be put in the schema, and the other is the layer that's going out and getting the data. So, for example, right now we have a worker that collects issues from GitHub, and the piece of that worker that puts the issues inside of the Augur schema is likely and will be reused, I think, when we go and collect issues for Bugzilla or another kind of issue tracking system. So we don't have to rewrite the logical insertion of a complete set of information from an issue tracker. We only have to sort out how to access the API. So anytime we have figured out how to put data from one data source into our schema, we have also half the work of getting it from any other data source done. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so before our data pipeline and our metrics pipeline was just one continuous thing, like we would, you know, get the data, transform it into a metric, and then return it to the user in one request. And what we've done now is we've made our um, data collection very highly distributed and that there's no central piece that needs to exist for data collectors other than the get um, other than the workers themselves so like each of these workers independently can collect data and the point of the broker is to tell them here's the data our you know the users are interested in seeing but theoretically like one could manually <laughs> feed data to all of these workers and then just Augur could run on the database that was built for it. And it doesn't, there's, there's, doesn't have to be any knowledge between the part that the user interacts with and the part that gets the data. So what's the logic of having each one of the workers connect to the database individually as opposed to handing it off to, I know the broker doesn't connect to the database, but handing it off to something like the broker that actually does the insertions? Uh, in my mind, and you know, Derek and Gabe, you tell me, but the way that we thought about it when we were building it was how to keep each worker as kind of a cohesive unit. So self-contained. Self so the worker is not responsible for knowing what work it needs to do. It gets told what to do. 
and it's only responsible for just going to do what it's told by the broker. And we leave the broker out of the insertion into the database because all the broker really needs to know is whether or not the worker finished that job. So okay. it's kind of like um, uh, the broker is sort of like a vice president of the bank that doesn't need to understand what the tellers are doing from day to day. I just insulted bankers, I'm sure. <laughs> so is that a good analogy? I don't know. They can cry too. So there's, there's, a, there's a, it seems like there's a little redundancy in those workers and that they all have to connect. The only redundancy is that they all have to connect the same way. Right. So um, just, the, the technical reason for that is the broker needs to be very low latency. Okay. And just like, I, it, because this broker and this Goody corn process are actually the same process and their jobs are just to hand off requests to something else as quickly as possible. So if it's an API request, it's gonna hand it off to one of the CUNY corner workers as quickly as possible. And if it's you know a metric request from one of the CUNY corner workers, it's gonna hand it off to um, the one of the workers as quickly as possible. Okay. And so um, this is like the central process, central state that exists in the application. And then each of these workers have two threads one thread that listens for um, new information from the broker and another thread that actually does the work. And so because there's kind of more, like there's an expectation that one of these threads is gonna be blocking at all times, um, it, it seemed appropriate to put the database connection here because it already had that blocking architecture to okay. gather the data. It might, we might as well wait on them to put stuff in the database as okay. well. Um, and then where are the queues stored? I so they're stored in the boot memory. They're, they're, what was that? I'm sorry. They're all uh, in memory. Okay. So if, for example, if Augur gets shut down because I shut it down and install a new version, which happens frequently enough for people, um, the memory of what work needs to be done will be rebuilt um, by, uh, there's a couple of tables where we persist the last uh, repository that a worker worked on. So if, if the, we shut down Augur in the middle of a collection, it's going to remember where it was when it left off and it'll just, the workers will, or the broker will tell the workers to start collecting wherever the workers last left a record of where they stopped, if that makes sense. So essentially the, the workers go through the repository job that they're given um, an item at a time and, and when they finish a job, they post it uh, to a, a persistence layer in the, da in the database that's used upon restart. Um, but otherwise, it lives in memory, as Derek describes. Mm -hmm. But because, yeah. So, okay. I'm good. Yeah. Oh, sorry, what were you going to say something, Matt? No, I'm good. Thanks. And the reason we have three workers is so that we can distribute um, distribute the work. So each of these can work on different jobs. So wow. we we could um, when we right now we're not doing this, but so every like if I'm collect, I've got an issue, I've got a worker for uh, repository commit information. I can have n of those workers uh, started up at any one time, and I can specify that in my configuration. If I'm a open source program office manager and I'm just going to run this on my local PC, uh, I'm probably not going to run more than one worker at a time, just because it wouldn't be practical. But if I'm a larger enterprise and I have eight 24 CPUs on a machine, uh, I may run like three GitHub workers at a time and three facade workers at a time and three other workers for, at a time. So it's it's scalable vertically, um, as Derek mentioned as well. So like you could have a whole if you're giant, you can have a whole computer dedicated to just getting GitHub issue data. Okay. Um, so I mean, I think I think what I really what I really like about what uh, Derek and the team put together here is that it solved the problem of all these different databases, and it also gives us, I think, a robust way of doing what, what I think about or I say I call continuous data collection, so that when you turn Augur on, it just starts collecting data and it keeps collecting data based on what it thinks you've told it to collect and, and so you, if you were turn it, to turn it off. Uh, and in that way, your data can be thought of as 
instead of having to wonder whether the GH torrent schema that you have is from last month or two months ago, now you, if you, depending how you set it up, it's in most cases, it's likely the data you have is no more than a day or two old, um, as long as you keep Augur continuously running. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously, the more repositories you want to track, um, the more time it takes to collect data for a cycle, and the, the more out of date your data could get if you have like just a laptop. Um, so if you're trying to do 6,000 repos on a laptop, that sounds like uh, a good plot for the next Die Hard film. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, my motivation for the architecture was primarily so that users um, would be able to choose their own um, sources. And the analysis that we provide and the working groups come up with uh, can be used with however they choose to collect their data. So because all of this is over TCP, and specifically it's all HTTP, so it's just the REST API, um, where you just put jobs and you post jobs, and then they, you know, they're gonna, so both the worker and the broker are um, HTTP servers. And so um, as long as you implement this API. Um, Which you have, basically you do when you install Augur. Right. So as long as you implement this API, you know, you can get all the configuration you need um, to, to connect to the database. You can get... Um, so I think the case you're making, sorry, you're off. I hear off. Oh, no, it's all good. I think what you're saying is building your own worker to collect data from a different source is a relatively trivial enterprise. You yeah. essentially look at an example of a worker that's collecting data from a source that has the same kind of data. Right. You already, then you know what, how to insert it into the schema. Mm -hmm. And then it's a question of reverse engineering, how you get it out of whatever different source you have. Yeah, exactly. So, and I think facade's a really good example of this because facade has an opinionated way that a lot of people really like about how to measure lines of code added and removed. But different organizations might have totally different ways of measuring that. They might use static analysis and really measure the complexity and their definition of what a line of code is might be totally different than another organization. And so they could have, or they could implement their own worker that by itself is a useful tool. And just by adding this API layer to it or adding some middleware that would translate between what their independent product does and the Augur schema and Augur API, then they can use their data with all of the metrics that we provide. Any, any questions or, or thoughts, ideas? Does this look as cool? Does this, we think this is really cool. We're curious um, how others are thinking of it. What concerns, complexities come to mind? I have feedback. Yeah. Andy. Um, so the feedback I wrote down in, in our notes, actually. Here, I'm trying to just figure out how to show the, let us see your video. If you just stop the share. Oh, there we go. All right. Sorry. Now we can see you and you can see us and it's maybe a little less weird for us. Okay. Sorry, Andy, go ahead. Uh, so if you, if you bring up our, um, our notes for the Augur working group, I, I wrote my feedback down in the notes so I can just read them off the, off the screen. Um, I see the themes and the possible quick, simple wins. Yes. Yes. That, so that, that's my feedback. So, um, my feedback number one is, um, uh, let's say as a community member, um, uh, what, I'm, what I'm interested in or what I think would be, what for sure would be helpful for me would be to look at Augur as a collection of standalone components that, that I could use sort of pick and choose which, which of the components I'd like to use to experiment with. And so one of the things I think I see is kind of a bias towards more integration and you know kind of a tightly integrated you know awesome system. Uh, so one of the things I would as a community member I'd like you guys to keep in mind is you know keep this sort of decoupling ethic in mind because uh, for me Augur would be more accessible let's say as a, as a collection of pieces rather than a, a tightly integrated whole. 
And maybe I'm mistaken in what I see. Maybe it is a, um, a you know, more decoupled than it looks uh, as an outsider. But, um, but that's at least one piece of feedback, something to keep in mind. In my wow. mind, uh, composability and decoupling are more important than a design for scalability. You know, right now we're, we're very low scale. We just have a tiny number of people. And so rather than worry about scalability, uh, to me, if we can get a group of people that are doing just simple things, low scale, hands on, you know, doing knowledge transfer and learning, that's where the big win is, I think, for us right now. And when we think about uh, community involvement, you know, uh, I think it's useful to break it out into two areas. You know, there's going to be a group of people who are interested in visualization. Um, so they're going to be interested in the UI that you guys have built, and they're also going to be interested in maybe experimenting with different UI styles. Maybe they want to write a, a very simplified UI that is just a dashboard for their own organization. Maybe they're going to want to experiment with different types of JavaScript, you know, matching utilities. Uh, maybe they're going to want to use totally different tools. You know, there's uh, Grafana is awesome. Uh, there's a, a tool called Chronograph, which is really awesome. And some of these tools you can just apply to um, Postgres databases themselves. So you could apply them to the raw, you know, Augur Postgres database. Um, and, you know, there's also techniques, maybe people would want to just experiment with exporting that Augur database into a time series database like Influx or, or TSDB. Um, so people are gonna wanna, I think, experiment with visualization and that's to our benefit to the extent that people are just trying stuff out and, and, and sharing. And then the other area that they'd like to experiment, I believe, is on the data ingestion side. Uh, and primarily, um, you know, we're, we're talking about the workers, maybe the, the job management strategies. It would be nice if that was decoupled. So you could just get in and let's say, let's say you wanted to pull data, uh, not from GitHub, but from, you know, one of the billion other types of issue trackers out there. You know, if your workers were packaged as standalone scripts, uh, then maybe as a hacker out in the field, I could just say, oh, this is similar to what I want. I'm gonna copy it, I'm gonna customize it. And by looking at the example scripts, I know what format Augur expects. And you could, you know, maybe you've got some sort of a protocol or, or maybe it's just as simple as a, a SQL insert statement, whatever that, whatever that interface is, if you understand as a, as an outsider, you know, you could, you could produce to that interface, that'd be great. And I, and I really like uh, quite a lot um, the worker architecture that uh, the Grimoire guys have done with Percival. You know, their, their workers are just standalone um, Python scripts and they produce JSON. So that's, that's a really nice sort of comprehensible thing. As a hacker, I, you know, I can just get right in and start banging on it. You know, I know I, I ingest from wherever and I output JSON, great. You know, I, I don't need uh, to sort of learn an architecture to figure that out. I mean, I, so let me just sort of like think about a couple of things that you've talked about. Um, the, if you look at the, one thing we haven't talked about is that the UI, while it is distributed as part of the Augur repo, is actually a completely separate and standalone part. I've actually, you can download, you can update that. It's called, it's in the front end directory and we start and stop that independently of the data collection right now. Right. And the, in examples like what Twitter showed at the Open Source Summit North America, their implementation of Augur, they never touched our front end. They didn't care. They didn't want yeah. it wanted heat, light, love, I think, or something uh, like that. And, and they, so they used the data that the back end gathered and put their own API in front of it, just like you described. Yes. Uh, and, and I think, so that's, that's kind of out of the box mm -hmm. that it does, does do that. Right now, the big thing that Carter is working on is this publish a script that generates a local Postgres database with the Augur schema. And actually, we have that box checked. 
Um, like the dev, the dev install does that now. Yeah, it, yeah. it, completely, it will completely do that. It will yeah. ask you for your database credentials, uh, create it on the server that you give, uh, for which you provided the credentials, and automatically set up um, all the database, all the schema you need. Um, and I actually am in the middle of working on the part that will also ingest the repos that you provide. Um, so it's 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 as easy as running the install script um, and of course providing valid credentials and then just specifying um, the, some, uh, a little bit of information about the repositories you want and then Audible will take care of the rest. So so uh, that's awesome. And I, I do think that the, the, the Augur schema is like the core value. You know, if we can get like the whole community to standardize on a schema and just start, you know, reading and writing from that s same schema, that to me is a beautiful part. Now, one of the things that I would like to say is, um, you know, sort of on this decoupling thing, you could, you can, in my opinion, just stop with the creation of the Augur database, you know, the sort of the ingestion part doesn't need to be integrated. That can be a, like a separate thing. And I think it would be uh, quite a big win to just have, um, let's say, a bash script that, that generates the Augur database locally. Or it could even be simpler than that. You know, you could just... We, we have that. Yeah. You know, you could, just, you could just say, look, here's my, my schema.psql file. And, and the instruction could be... Um, you know, do a POS, PSQL dash U Postgres, you know, uh, pipe in from the PSQL file. That'd be, that'd be awesome. So, uh, I, super yeah, simple. I, I think, so, I, do you guys understand? So, I, I think the main one thing is that the use case we're sort of focused on, like one of the significant differences between how cool Percival is, um, the coolest of Percival is that it gets you basically almost anything that you any data you want up to a certain point. Like I think it, it like everything else sort of suffers when it gets to weird mailing lists. Um, I think there's just a weird mailing list category that all of us are always gonna wrestle with. Um, but basically otherwise Percival gets you everything. Um, but it, it gets it for you in a non-structured way that's defined by the source. And the difference with Augur is that all of the data is structured. And I think Derek explained this a little bit with the architecture. So because all the data that you get ends up structured the same regardless of the source, you have these RESTful API endpoints and front end that you can use to understand and interpret the data regardless of the source without having to go back and reverse engineer the way that it's collected. Um, so once you get through this, this map of building a worker and putting data in the schema, you have, regardless of the source, all the same data. And it's a, it's a technical choice. I think it's an architectural trade-off that, that we considered. And we used Percival pretty extensively uh, in the summer of 2018. Mm -hmm. And I think where we struggled was when we had different data sources for the same kind of data, um, making it be shaped the same so that we could provide endpoints. Right. So we, we put the labor into just having a collection, a consistent way of delivering the resulting data and a consistent way of collecting it. So the scheme is kind of this architectural um, mediation point where the data we collect has to be transformed into that format to be stored. And the API will always work against that schema. Right. So regardless of the source, you, you have that. And I think that the main use case we've been focused on, which uh, I think we're very close to meeting, is like your, your small scale open source program manager being able to put Augur into play to collect data um, just by installing it locally uh, for, a, for a limited number of sites, obviously. And yeah. I, I'd also, I'd like to address your concerns. Uh, so my full-time job is, uh, I'm a Linux admin, so I, I'm, I'm pretty familiar with the philosophy of do one thing and do it well. Right. Um, <laughs> and I, I totally agree that composability is extremely important. And I think, um, I think this architecture compared to what we had before is way, way, way less decoupled. So before every metric was coupled with its data source. Way more decoupled. Yeah, it's way more decoupled than that. It's, like, and 
and a lot of the motivation for um, how we designed the um, workers were that as long as you can write an application that um, can insert data into a database, you can meet the barest minimum for what a worker needs to do to be able to work with the Augur schema. And um, I think that makes it more accessible if someone had, wanted to add like a new type of version control um, or if they wanted to look at a new competitor to GitHub. As long as they can use our schema, they can at least manually generate the data needed to get all of these metrics that the community comes up with out of it. Um, and you also mentioned Percival. Um, to, talk, to demonstrate the extensibility of Augur, I, I think that in order to wrap Percival, we would just need one Python script that can you know, listen to our broker's messages, translate those into Percival, Percival calls, and then shoot it back into the Augur scheme. Um, and so the worker would have to do the translation, like, because Percival can get dozens of different data sources, right. and, uh, many different issue trackers. So if we did something like that, the wrapping of Percival, yeah. we'd be responsible for translating whatever the source is back into our schema. Right. So the work of, basically the work of the worker collecting it using, for example, Percival, yeah. uh, puts it into a shape that it can be delivered in the same way that all the other data that you've gathered. Yeah, so it's it's creating work in the collection, right? By by having us have to translate the results that Percival sends us to our schema, but it reduces effort at the time of understanding what my systems are. Right, but we only need. I, I guess what I'm trying to say is like we only you only need in order to add new data to Augur, like one new tool essentially. Um, and each worker by themselves is independently able to build pieces of the Augur schema from its data source. Some workers, like the GitHub worker, we expect will be able to build pretty much a complete schema independently of any other tool. Um, so if it's something that you're expressing the community has interest in, one thing we can look into doing is making the GitHub worker a proof of concept as a worker that can independently build the um, Augur schema without any other input. So you wouldn't need the broker to be running, you wouldn't need the front end to be running. As long as you put, you have a method to submit jobs to the GitHub worker manually, then you could build the, the Augur schema. That sounds great. And, and by the way, let me emphasize, uh, the things I wrote down, wrote down here are not concerns, they're just feedback. I think the work that you guys are doing is awesome. No, and, and I, I think we, yeah, uh, we, we kind of know, I mean, we definitely know the choices we made. Yeah. Like, like it's any, any kind of system, we, we, we traded things off. And, um, and, and so something like, uh, like reducing integration, coupling of standalone components, um, this is, I wonder themes, these are things you're saying that we are saying that we've aimed for, right? Yeah. Right. And then under a read-only instance DB, uh, we kind of, you know, actually we have that in a number of places. And I think it's like, for example, for the value working group that you lead, Andy, we, we have an instance that uh, collects data. I don't know that I have uh, a front end pointed to it, but we have that set of repositories that we're using, the one that you and I had talked about months ago, right? Um, that we're continuously collecting data on. And I probably could update your interface because I have lost track of where that's at. Um, but then that data that we've collected could be this, it, it's the, the trick is it's, there's like four, 2000 repos in that collection. Mm -hmm. and that gets kind of large. So what is an optimal read only instance for people to experiment with? I think might be one question. Well, we have. well, like for example, um, if you could give me the IP address of that the fire trucks aren't pulling up in front of the building that we're in. <laughs> oh, okay. I've been evacuated from this building before. Well, if, right. if I see so smoke, if we suddenly have to go. That's what's going on. Yeah, if I see oh, smoke okay. in here. Yeah. Well, I don't hear the alarm in here. So. Not yet. So anyway, Sean, if if you could give me the IP address of that of that server and the database name and and let me let me find out where the endpoints and a, and a username and a password you know with read only so so i'm not you know blowing away 
uh, the hard work that's been done out of stupidity, that'd be really cool. You know, and I could just query it right from here. Yeah. I mean, I think that's entirely doable. I, I do that for, uh, I do that for people. So, um, let me honestly, Andy, let me remember where I have that. Like I know I run it and, and it's collecting, but we have a lot of instances of auger and I'm a researcher and not a systems administrator. <laughs> and I, I can't remember, and it's like, it's a little embarrassing, but I, I'm pretty sure I know that one. And I'm pretty sure I know what server it's on, but let me just pass that to you separately. Okay. Yeah, and I, I think the reason we haven't designed, um, I mean, we, we built it in a way, I think that if you're a user that wants to run Grafana and wants to build your own dashboards, then it's still, Augur's still going to work for you because like Sean said, you don't need to be running any, like you don't need to be serving any of our static files for the API that serves metrics to work. Um, you don't even, you don't need to be running um, Augur, you don't need to have any web work like threads in order for the data collection piece of Augur to work. Um, right. So I think that, um, so, yeah, oh, yeah, okay. yeah, exactly. So I think that even for power users that do want to build completely independent dashboards, it'll work. I think the reason we've chosen to kind of force everybody through this database is because um, we think that this is the best way we can at, like represent the chaos community's interests in terms of metrics. Because then we have this one way to talk about metrics. We say, this is the query we use. These are the filters we apply, you know, and then this is the metric we get. And so when the chaos community comes up with a new metric, we can then say, here's how to get it. And then we, where we built the most extensibility is in what data you feed to that. Um, yeah. We haven't built, we haven't focused as much on the extensibility of building new visualizations, just because we're really focused on building the visualizations for the community. Um, okay. But we will we'll definitely keep that in mind. And we do have the REST API available for folks that are right now using their own visualization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I guess I, I am curious, I mean, what do folks think about, like if we were to distribute like a version of Augur in a Docker container with a sample schema, um, how, how many repositories uh, would be helpful for, like I'm thinking in the neighborhood of 20 to 50 repositories grouped in some way and would there be ones that the community in general would understand well enough so that they could see something that they understand uh, in inside of Augur's front end and back end, you know, plug and play to see something that, that is meaningful on a broad scale. Like the, the value collections that we did, I think to, to, to some extent have, they're very wide but some of those organizations that we chose do a lot of forking of other people's repos, so it gets a little weird. Um, I also think we should consider um, distributing just a database dump, like MSR did. Yeah. Or uh, like the of, that, And I think that's kind of what Andy's asking for. Yeah. And, and it's like, what of? I mean, I think my question is, what of? What would be the right sample? So my, my response would be, um, I think the minimum number of repos that would be interesting would be two. Okay. And so you'd like to compare your project to one other project and that's that. So just, just the, the simplest possible thing to get up and running, I'd focus okay. on that use case. Well, that, that, that makes it, that's, yeah, it makes it a lot easier. Any other thoughts on is two enough? This seems like a good idea, super simple. Yeah. Yeah. I think that most of your feedback really highlights to me like how we need to be thinking about different levels of users mm -hmm. and how some people are going to be really interested in getting their hands dirty and playing with the data. Yeah. And yeah, other people, is. yeah, and other people are going to be, they're going to want a report delivered on their desk and they're going to want to make a decision. And kind of the, the group that we've been targeting is like your open source community manager, your open source program office manager with like around 100 right. or less repos um, so that they can get something up and running quickly. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where the work that Carter and Gabe have been doing in our strengthening our ability to do that. And I right. think once we get to the point where people can add their own 
repos easily, which we're very close to, then then that use case becomes kind of hardened, and mm -hmm. um, we can distribute a version of Augur that does that for people, and also a version that includes this sample database. Um, and we have to be careful about the sample we choose, <laughs> right? Because <laughs> Because like uh, I, I used for a long time Rails as an example, and I continued to use Rails in some recent demos. And I realized that including Rails, I, I didn't include the data. I just had Rails as one of the repos that I would go and get. And it would always be like this giant data collection effort yeah. um, right. for every demo. So um, it might be a good example to distribute because it is a complex ecosystem. But uh, it might not be a great example for like as if you're going to go collect it. I, I actually think even the simpler simpler repos would be the way to go. I mean, yeah. based on what Andy's saying, I think the the point I'm guessing, Andy, the, the point is is you just want to get these visuals in front of people that I don't need to be able to to get my head around a complex ecosystem. I just want to see what Augur can do. Yeah, just just simple things, and you know, funny enough. Um, Sometimes it's easier to satisfy the needs of the power user than it is the, um, you know, the, the uninformed or the, the lower sophisticated user. You know, the power user just, need, just needs the IP address and the database name and, and, you know, there's a lot that power users can do with that. Yeah. Um, and what you're offering is a super unique resource, you know, a database schema with a lot of thought behind it and workers to ingest data. That's a huge amount of work for a power user. Um, and uh, so just something to think about. Yeah, no, we appreciate that. We, I mean, these are things that we definitely should think about. Right. Um, I think that what this really reinforces to me is we need to make sure that there is a really like a strong line, like separation between the workers and the broker and the web UI. Mm -hmm. That like perhaps even you know our API server is separate than our broker because right now that I mean all the requests go to the same server mm -hmm. um, and they coordinate via that central first process right um, and so I do think we could decentralize even more and um, and the other thing that um, it, I think stands out to me is that like people are going to be interested in just like one worker what it's doing like right. how does this worker get this data yeah well i think the, the like the so like we had this this is all about the architecture so that people understand how we collect data but i think i think we heard loud and clear on last week's call there's some basic evolution metrics that are in over his bogger that like our first order of business is to get some things back in the ui that we took out mm -hmm. um and have the comparisons like if you we've done some games on a ton of ui adaptations since our last auger meeting and I think Carter's done a ton of uh, installation work. So we get a stable version out the door that, that works for this program officer, program, open source program office manager and community manager role. Uh, and then, then we start thinking about what, what's next. Right. Uh -huh. So I think that we should come up with a set of use cases, like starting from I want the whole package, you know, I don't, yeah. I just want to enter like a username and password, put in a repo and get a report and going all the way to, I don't even want to use the Augur schema, but I want to see how Augur is, you know, transforming its data into a coherent way. I like, think that first use case is the one that's most popular. Yeah. Um, if, I, if I've heard people on this call. Right. And so I think that maybe we should build, like, I, I think a lot of this is just a lack of communication and documentation on our part. Like, I think Augur right now could be used as a Grafana backend comfortably. I think Augur right now, um, you know, is something that is not, like, should, ideally is not difficult to add new data collection to. But I think that we haven't documented that process at all. And since we've built everything and we've made a lot of assumptions, it's hard to be able to definitively say it. it's easy because we haven't, like, I guess we haven't gotten into the point yet where we feel comfortable saying, hey, community, you know, here's where you put this piece if you, if you want to work on this. Here's where you put that piece yeah. if you want to work. And maybe, maybe some of that documentation and making clear to people how to 
contribute downstream to Augur. By building, if they build a worker that's useful to them, they can contribute that to the Augur upstream. And they, you know, making that more clear to people may also be a goal. That's the part of the, the stability sprint that we're in right. The right now is literally writing, rewriting all of the documentation, adding new sections for broker stuff, adding new sections for worker stuff, mm -hmm. adding new sections for um, like creating a new metric under the schema, creating uh, like all of that stuff. It's like I have it all like at all right now. Like okay. how I'm planning to do it. Yeah. So it'll happen. Yeah. And we'll, I think what we'll also look into making the workers able to output CSVs so that, like you said, if someone wanted to use TimescaleDB um, or, or other um, different databases, they would have the ability to still collect data with our um, opinionated schema, but then put it into a different database of their choice. Oh, that'd be awesome. That'd, that'd be really smart. Yeah, I, so one of the things that I think your design is really going to the forefront is being able to have all of these different data sources and calculate the same metrics in the same way once it's in the database. Mm -hmm. and I, I like this idea, the direction that we're thinking right now is with having your workers output a standardized format. And then we can even address the concern that Matt had with having only one component that takes that format, puts it into the database. It doesn't have to be the broker. It can be a separate piece that just takes the CSV file that is always standard to put it. That way, if you change anything, you don't have to change all the workers to talk to the database again. Right. Oh, just my, my thoughts. That's a good point, like decoupling the, the insertion of a model from the collection. Mm -hmm. That's really yeah, we like the idea. And I, I've also, I work in HPC and there's a tool called XDMod um, that ingests data from schedulers um, and shows interesting metrics. Um, so it's very similar to what we do with Augur, just a totally different domain. And though it has parsers for each scheduler's output, um, there's, like uh, um, Georg just said, um, CSVs is the way it ingests all the other data. So I think like that's a proven methodology and I think it does make it easy to hack on. Like, you know, I can write a Python script that'll output that CSV file and then just submit it to the server and it'll output. So I do think we have some more thinking to do and I really appreciate your guys' feedback. Um, it's very helpful and I would love the CSV idea and we'll, we'll all discuss it. So uh, we, we appreciate it. Well, we didn't get to the UI. Oh, right. Yeah. So, so um, um, uh, I think I think um, I have an instance of Augur up here. Uh, that's not it. That's not it. Oh, yeah. Let's change it from view app to Augur. Yeah. Um, so, the revised or the updated Augur schema right now. Uh, and I think I think I may not have flushed this cache, so hold on one second. Um, where's my Zoom? There's no Zoom controls. Uh, like, uh, Are you still sharing your screen? Yeah, I'm trying That's to. down on your dock. Oh, OK, thank you. All right, I just want to share a different window. Um, Having this up now makes it harder. Sorry, just one second. Because I'm always going after new versions of Augur all the time, my browser cache gets kind of a mess. Um, so I just, uh, is it, uh, okay. Sorry, now I'm going to share a page. Um, so last week when we talked, the first page that you saw was the inside page. And based on the feedback of this community, uh, why don't you, why, yeah, why don't you guys think, Gabe? Yeah. Based on the feedback of the community, Gabe made uh, some changes. So the first page that you see right now is the repository group page. 
and this just happens to be one place where it's uh, it's kept. Uh, and so there's only one repo group in this particular example right now. Yeah, and the motivation behind this, Matt, you brought up a great point uh, during our last meeting, how uh, having the insights as a loading page can be kind of confusing to, uh, to new users who are just maybe looking just to look at their own repo groups right away and the insights can be a little confusing. They don't know what they're looking at quite yet. Um, it may be appealing to the case that they know where they want to look right away. They want to go straight to this repo group and straight to a, a particular repo. Um, and then uh, some changes. So that, that one, I think the, I'm still working on the, the risk data for this instance. Um, so the reason that's spinning and the risk data is not there yet, I'm working with Matt Snell on what I'm doing wrong. <laughs> So we'll, we'll figure we'll figure out where I've done that's, something stupid. That's an example. So that right there is an example of the ability to use separate tools to add data to the Augur database in the mm -hmm. Augur schema and then still analyze it from this one unified um, view, whether that's our right. front end or that's our API. Yeah, and this, this instance just suffers from my not understanding what I'm doing with a tool that's new to us. But we're, we're, we're going to have this morning, and we'll get we'll get that working. Uh, we have other instances where it's working, but we haven't updated the rest of the UI. Um, and then there's still so basically, this, we we've, we've changed everything so that you start with a much simpler view. Yeah, and I think this is the page that should show the evolution metrics down <laughs> below. So if you scroll down, mm -hmm. game, I think what Matt's saying is okay. We've got all the commit data, and I think we also want to see. Basically, all those old graphs that we had against GH torrent showing like issue data. Yeah. And it's like we probably want to have it handle it so that if the metric has no data, like for example, since if the issue tracker isn't GitHub and the issue tracker isn't something that we gather data for, probably don't want to show them issue data at all. Don't even show a blank. Like, so instead so of showing the no data here icon, we just probably scroll down a little bit too. Leave it out. So I know we're out of time. It's two o'clock, but scroll down just a little bit, Gabe. Yeah. So that bar right there, if you put your cursor over it, it says total lines changed. It's always stuck at 50,000. Oh, um, it's amazing how coherent and consistent the open source community is, Matt. <laughs> Every time. <laughs> uh, that's something we should look into. Yeah. I think right now it's capped at a limit uh, for the purpose of keeping the size of these circles contained. That's um, just something to point out. Either yeah. fix it or get rid of it. Yep. Yeah. You can use a yeah, actually getting rid of it for now probably the simple answer. Because mm -hmm. the, the net line's at it if you scroll a little bit to the right. And then scroll up a little bit. I think the other really the other really important thing here is scroll up. Is right now keep going. Um, to get to the risk metrics right now, yeah, you have to go through the evolution page, which is a. I had given some advice on, kind of putting some, links over there on the left side. So would 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 risk potentially be a left? So like, if I had a risk on the left tab, would that now you're not seeing risk metrics, but would I see? A list of repos that would then take me to risk metrics, or would it be better if we showed? Um, I think when you're on th this page, if you click on any of the repos, you go to the evolution page. And that's I think just, that's what that happens. Seems to be the most logical place that people. We did that. Get. Yeah. And, and so and then from this point over on the left side, in that big white area, you could yeah. have three links, which would be this repository's risk information this repository's insights and this repository's evolution page. I mean, it's a recursive link, but. I see. So essentially, we would get rid of insights, repos, and groups. Nope. And, so let me, share, let me share my screen. OK. Um, let, it, let us unshare ours, because <laughs> I think that's necessary. Yep. Um, hold on just a second. So I know it's after 2, so if folks need to go. 
she's here. Yeah, yeah I'm gonna okay. drop off. Thank you very much for showing the architecture on the work list today. See you later, Georg. All right. Yeah. Are you you want to send us the screens that you have, Matt? Or no, I already shared it in Slack. Oh, okay. This, this is that thing that I shared. I mean, oh, I, oh, oh, that. Yeah, I had like. Guys, I'm going to sign off too. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you yeah. so much. Andrew. All right, thanks, All right. thanks everybody. Thank you. Um, thank you guys. So yeah, Matt, yeah, I'll just I'll finish this thought here. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't mind staying for a second. Yeah, yeah. Might have, we might have missed. I might have missed something in interpreting this. So so this is the so when you so the idea here is you obviously end up at this. This is the landing page, right? And then you click on one of these things, just like you guys had, and it takes you to the list, just like what you showed. And then if I click on one of these, this goes to the evolution page, which is actually this page, which is what you're showing. Yeah. So and it has all this stuff at this the bottom, like all of this going down. But at the same time, you get these three links over here. I see. So okay. this repository's insights. So at this point, I'm just looking at this repo as a user. Right. So I want I want I want to understand this repository's risk information. I want to understand this repository's evolution, which I'm currently looking at, and I want to understand this repository's insights. If I click on risk, it takes me to that repo's risk page. Right. And then I still have these same links over here. Uh, that makes a ton of sense. And if I click on this repository's insights, it takes me only to insights for that repository. That makes, do you understand that? Yeah, yeah, that makes well, a ton of sense. And I like that idea. Just, it's only, I'm just trying to investigate a little bit about this repo. Yeah. The yeah. risk, the evolution, and the insights. And, and uh, like, yep. Uh, can you go to the page that lists the repos? So how do you feel about um, where previously that options column was, that's uh, removed now um, and is soon to be updated, but where that is maybe, how do you, how would you feel about putting maybe some links to go directly to that repos either risk insight or evolution page yeah that'd be fine right here too okay yep okay yeah and still have the sidebar things yep. so i think um yeah i i like the general like idea of making sure that there's a clear way to navigate between the views but i just have a small i guess difference of opinion and where it should exist mm -hmm. that i think um, rather than having um, the links appear below, I think there should be another slightly darker sidebar added once you're in the context of a single repo that would have each view in a list like like the links that you had. Yeah, totally fine. I just I just want to keep people localized in that repo. Yeah, I completely agree. Yeah. Yeah, this was made at a swimming pool while I was waiting. I was. <laughs> Just trying. <laughs> I think I use I was using PowerPoint or something to get this done. So no, I, however it is, yeah, this, this has been so helpful, Matt. Yeah, yeah. I just think we need to keep people localized. We were taking people like to the group, and then insights was at this really high level, and then sometimes we would get them down to the evolution page, and then it was I think really confusing. So, however we keep people localized, even if it's whatever. I think Derek, this is what you're talking about like a better place to put this. Yeah, because I essentially see these as top level views wow. that should feel like different applications on each different view. And then on the inside is the page that you're navigating currently. And that's where the bread comes from should be relative to. And if we need, if we want to keep the sidebar navigation consistent, rather than adding it to the existing sidebar, we should just have another sidebar inside of the page. That's fine, um, yeah. I mean, and so then this repository inside is the sidebars. Right. We need to think about it, but I, I yeah. do completely agree there needs to be like a coherent navigation pattern that's that doesn't change whenever you click on something. And I think when you click so now you have this labeled as insights. Mm -hmm. So this is at the instance insights page. Like right. the like the the auger instance for this group, which I think is fine. I don't mind that. So you'd click on insights and I think honestly 
you would only see kind of these maybe top five insights across the entire thing. Yeah, and I have actually haven't run the insight worker on the instance I was using today. So insights shows you nothing. But like this is really like this is interesting. So like with Blacklight, I can see that this repository had a sharp decrease in, in new issues 86 days ago. That's that's interesting. Mm -hmm. And then Senate, however you say it. I mean, obviously this is a different repository, kind yeah. of located. And it tells me something about that too. And then this tells me something about this one. So maybe like the top five or top 10, just something simple. And then I think these like new repositories or this, I think this got a little confusing because this started, these views are across everything. Right. And these views are localized now to repositories. Repository groups. Are these, are these right. groups. Mm -hmm. And so you kind of have these two different levels it's in this one page. Too much. It's, yeah. it's like asking the user to understand that there's different contexts when we're not making that clear. Correct. And so then I think if, you know, if you show these top five, super interesting, people just want to get that quick view. And then if you'd like, or if you have a navigation page, it was just an, an ability to get just this link here, specific insights on this repo, evolution on this repo and risk on this repo. It was really just, again, to get people back into those really localized things about that repository. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think our vision for this page was that the users would be able to log in and then these insights would be customized to their repos and repo groups. And so it kind of would have been like a Facebook feed or something like that, where mm -hmm. they can just scroll down and see the stuff that's relevant to them. Um, but I think because right now we're still in the scope that every instance of Augur as it's like set set of repos and repo groups, yep. so it, it doesn't make very much sense. And I, I totally agree. Yeah, the insights, it was a, that was a, it was a lot of um, like cognitive overhead for people. Yeah. yeah. Right when they were landing on that page. And I, it's a really cool idea and being yeah. able to send these to people. I think, the Slack, I think when it's connected to the Slack bot is when it's going to really That's amazing. Be cool. I mean, it's a super great idea. So. That's why I suggested repo groups because it's just super simple. People will recognize. Yeah, the changing of scope is really confusing. I completely agree. Yeah, and if you let people like subscribe to a Slack bot off of an instance, then then the insights I think that get pushed to them are the ones that are valuable. Yeah, like they're not as likely to go to the dashboard. I think as they are to respond to a Slack bot or look at something a Slack bot sends them that looks that 